Okay, well, I think we could get started. Now let me, right, Andy, are you with us? Andrea is muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, uh, yes we can. Uh, hey. Sorry about that. that. We're ready to get started, everyone? Yeah. Yeah, let's roll it. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrea Burns. I'm a board member of the Massachusetts Peace Action. And I'd like to welcome everyone tonight to the first session of our uh, Peace Action webinar series, Responding to the Coronavirus Outbreak, the Fund Healthcare Not Warfare series. We will be trying to address questions such as, how is it that in the richest country on earth, our frontline healthcare workers lack, lack masks, gowns, and respirators? We believe that part of the answer is the diversions of more than half of our income and tax dollars to the paying for foreign wars, new weapons, and a new nuclear arms race. Given the efforts of the Trump administration to downplay and undermine the nation's scientific resources, we are starting with a straightforward talk on the coronavirus itself, the infectious agent causing this disease. Our speaker, Jonathan King, co-chair of the Mass Peace Action Board, is a professor at MIT who has long studied the structure and assembly of viruses and the folding of virus proteins. So Jonathan, take it away. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you to all of you who are on, uh, on board. Um, this uh, slide talk will be in three parts. Uh, I'll go for about 15 minutes about on the uh, virus structure itself and some of the history, and then break and take your questions. Uh, and then the second uh, 10 or 15 minutes will be on vaccine and therapy development and what's going on in terms of the federal budget. And then we'll open up the, um, the floor will be open in, in general. Now, I wanna start off by making sure that everybody's clear about the difference between bacteria which are or organisms that you know live everywhere in soil and uh, in, in water and animals and, and plants, and a few of which, uh, if they get in you, cause nasty infections: cholera, pneumonia, diphtheria, tuberculosis, whooping cough, meningitis. Uh, when you antibiotics are drugs that interfere with the growth of bacteria. Very important to distinguish them from viruses. Viruses are uh, essentially inert when by themselves, they're obligate parasites. They can only reproduce by getting inside a cell. If they get inside a human cell, um, you, you can get some nasty diseases, influenza, polio, HIV, uh, cold sores, smallpox, and then mild ones, uh, mild ones too. Now, uh, by the way, Antibiotics have no effect whatsoever on viruses. It's very important you know that. There's many people, you go to the clinic, you have an upper respiratory infection, they can't tell whether it's bacterial or viral. They give you antibiotics no matter what because it might be bacterial. And so some people fall into thinking that antibiotics can interfere with viral infections. No. Um, now, um, the history of um, development of virology in the United States uh, derives from the polio epidemics that struck down, uh, you know, millions of Americans in the 30s and 40s and uh, infected FDR. He was paralyzed from the waist, waist down all the time that he was president. He, you know, he either sat or he needed bra braces. The combination of the nation's leader, being ill from uh, uh, polio, and thousands of, of children being paralyzed led to a national campaign called the March of Dimes. Some of you are old enough to remember the March of Dimes. Uh, Brian Garvey, who's not on the call, reminded me that that's why FDR's face is still on the, the dime. Now, uh, these um, 
viruses, polio virus is very severe. Let's, but take, let's take flu. Even now, there are millions of cases a year and a large number of deaths, even with the flu uh, vaccine, same with HIV. And, you know, viruses are not going away as we get a solution to, to one of them, another one uh, pops up. Now, the first virus that was discovered was a virus of, in the 1920s that infected plants, infected tobacco plants, caused the loss of the crop, and agricultural scientists started studying it. It's on the left, you see this long rod-shaped particle, and that particle is made of just two components. The inside is the genome, which is a long RNA molecule spiraling around, and you see it's covered by these kidney-shaped units, and these are protein subunits. We call them coat proteins or capsid proteins. And that um, lingo is also used when you come to coronaviruses, a set of proteins that form the outside of the virus and protect it, uh, protect the, uh, the inside nucleic acid. Um, the second historical feature um, that's important with respect to, un to um, what we now know about viruses is that uh, the millions of GIs that returned home after World War II, they and their families expected to have free health care. When you're on the battlefield, you call a medic, you don't have to show your health insurance. And in the late 1940s, there was an intense national debate, uh, similar to the national debate now, about whether we should have a national health insurance or a national health service, in, in fact. And I, I, I remember that on the radio between five and, and six, when I listened to the Lone Ranger and the Shadow, there were ads warning against socialized medicine. Um, well, the privatization forces beat back National Health Service and National Health Insurance, but Truman's compromise was to permit federal support of biomedical research, not direct health care, but biomedical research. And the National Institutes of Health uh, was given, a, was established and given funding. And ever since then, uh, biomedical research uh, has been supported by your taxpayers' money through the National Institutes of Health. That's a place in Bethesda, Maryland, but really it's an agency that distributes funds around the country. Now, the first viruses that we really uh, understood in some depth were viruses that infect bacteria. Yes, bacteria get infected by viruses too just like plants and animals. And those viruses are called bacteriophage from the French to eat, back to eat bacteria. Um, they're very simple. Uh, and it was the study of these bacteriophages that led to the modern understanding that uh, DNA or RNA was the genetic material was responsible for hereditary transmission, that proteins were the building blocks uh, and the and the machinery of of, of all, all, all cells and kind of launched us in, into the, the the modern world of modern genetics and, and biotechnology. So they were they were very important. Here is a slice through a bacterial cell. That's actually a Salmonella bac typhimurium. And here you see a phage particle that an hour before the sample was prepared, it attached to the cell surface and it injected its DNA into the cells. And these particles were physically, were assembled inside the cell in the hour following. And in another 20 minutes, the cell will break open and release hundreds of virus particles, which would go on to infect other cells. And the same thing goes on with animal viruses. So we understood it first with bacterial viruses. Now it turned out that almost all of our, the great majority of viruses, um, uh, the, the big one here on the left is herpes that causes cold, cold sores. Here's rotavirus that causes infantile di di diarrhea. Uh, some of these viruses are plant viruses. They infect plants. You'll notice that they're all roughly spherical. In fact, they're so, um, most of you took geometry a long time ago in high school, and you learned about the uh, Euclidean, regular Euclidean solids like tetrahedrons. These are all icosahedral. They have 12 vertices and 20 faces. Uh, the fact that this great diversity of organisms all follow this kind of single pattern was very important. Intellectually, it, it recruited uh, physicists and computer scientists um, 
people for whom you know most biological phenomena were too complicated and, and, and too messy. So these viruses uh, became a paradigm of, of modern biology. Now, in general, what happens is for an animal, a virus that's going to infect, for um, a virus that's going to infect an animal cell, uh, the virus uh, proteins on the virus are recognized by receptors on the surface of the cell. They're not looking for the virus; they're looking for something else. Uh, maybe nutrition, amino acids, uh, vitamin C, etc. Uh, but anyway, the virus binds to the cell, and then it gets internalized. The, the uh, cell membrane invaginates, and the virus is brought uh, into the cell. The cell's apparatus breaks down this very stable virus particle, but that releases the genetic material uh, into the into the cell, and it's replicated in hundreds of thousands of copies and it takes over the cell's protein synthesizing apparatus and directs the synthesis of thousands or tens of thousands of more coat molecules, for example, the coat protein molecules that, that build each, each particle. Now, the structure of the virus is very important. It's the outside of the virus that is binding and recognizing the host cells. And when we get to the part about vaccines, you will learn, if you don't already know it, that the antibodies circulating in your body that protect you, that are stimulated by um, the uh, uh, vaccine, uh, they bind to the outside of the virus, and that's how they block the infectivity. Most vaccines are themselves inactivated virions. Virion is the single, a, uh, a single virus particle is called a virion. Um, now, I, I didn't go into it, I mentioned very quick, quickly, even though I've spent my life studying it, that the assembly of the virus inside the cell is also a target for, for a class of antiviral drugs that interfere with the assembly of, of the virus as opposed to the attachment. Now, let's look at a few. Here's adenoviruses. These cause upper respiratory infections, common colds, uh, head, head colds. They're kind of widely uh, distributed in the environment. Almost everybody gets over them. We don't normally worry about them. Here's a higher resolution uh, is a electron micrograph, cryo-electron micrograph taken at low temperature. Uh, and you'll see at the, at the vertices, which I mentioned of the icosahedron, there are these spikes. So these spike proteins are a very important class of proteins because it's generally the spike proteins that allow the virus to attach to the host cell. And that's the case for coronavirus, flu, and many, many uh, viruses. So the, there's a coat that's protecting and making the shell of the virus. And then there's these specialized proteins that stick out that are important for binding to the cell. Here's influenza virus. So in, in, with influenza virus, there's a, there's a second dimension of complexity. There's a shell um, that uh, has capsid proteins that are surrounding nucleic acid. But outside the shell, there's a, a membrane envelope, just like cells have membranes. There's a membrane that's derived from the, from the host cell. And you can see sticking out of the membrane are these spike proteins. Uh, in, uh, for inf influenza, these are called hemagglutinins. Uh, you, some of you know that uh, flu viruses have names like H1N1. Well, the two proteins that stick out of the flu membrane are hemagglutinin for H, and the, there's another class of proteins, N neuraminidase. So H1N1 is a flu virus that has type 1 hemagglutinin on the surface, and type one uh, uh, neuraminidase on, on the surface, That's, that, which is not a bad way uh, to, to name them. But once again, the flu virus binds to the cell, gets incorporated into the cell, the cell breaks down the virus particle, the genetic material is released and then replicates inside the cell. All right, so that brings us to coronavirus. The name comes from this corona of spikes, uh, um, projecting from the cell surface. Flu virus could have been called coronavirus too, but uh, we, it's, it was identified first from the symptoms of a sick person 
and not from micrographs of the vir virus. It has RNA as the genetic material. When we get to the, to the point about talking about new um, therapies, it turns out that's where it becomes important to know whether the organism uses RNA as its genetic material or DNA. These coronaviruses are very common among mammals and birds, typically causing mild respiratory illness. Some fraction of the normal colds that Americans get are caused not by this coronavirus, but by close cousins. Now, the two previous major outbreaks with severe uh, symptoms, SARS in 2002, 2004, severe acute respiratory syndrome, and then MERS, uh, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, not so long ago. Um, MERS uh, is thought to have been transmitted from, from camels. Uh, the coronavirus, this one, COVID-19, uh, is thought to have come from, from bats. So uh, all animals, uh, you know, carry viruses, uh, and um, normally they're, they're not necessarily sick from them. But when you have a situation where the forest is being cut down or there's a, acute poverty and people are eating animals that normally wouldn't eat, uh, or there's um, a civil war and uh, distress, you get this increased transfer of viruses that are started in an animal, but they move into, um, into humans. COVID, by the way, COVID stands, this is a weird name. This is then, it's not the, this is coronavirus disease of 2019. It's the name of the disease. Um, for political reasons, uh, it was decided to give the virus the name of the disease. The actual um, name that a, a virologist would use would be SARS-CoV-2, but we're gonna stick with COVID-19. That is kind of uh, s s stuck. So we're gonna call the virus with the same name as, as the disease. Uh, there it is, an enhanced electron micrograph. They're not red in nature. This, this is colored uh, for, um, for, for the viewer. But those red knobs are the spikes uh, sticking out from coronavirus. Uh, and um, it's those red spikes that recognize receptors on the surface of your cells of your respiratory system and your lungs. By the way, the the receptor uh, is uh, a protein that uh, uh, I, I don't know how many of you uh, take take uh, uh, blood pressure medicines, but I do. I take something called uh, lisinopril, uh, and uh, the the uh, uh, the uh, the uh, ACE the receptor on the cell surface is a close cousin of the enzyme that regulates. Uh, blood pressure, and that uh, blood pressure medicines like lisinopril are uh, target. Um, the the uh, ACE receptor is not there so that lung cells can bind um, COVID-19. It's there having to do with the regulation of blood pressure in, in, the, in the lung tissue. ACE. Uh, now, just uh, very briefly, these viruses are all, they're inactivated by 70% ethanol and 90% isopropanol. That's the rubbing alcohol you would get at CVS or, or Walgreens, inactivated by bleach, soap and detergents because the membrane is fatty, is, is, is lipid, it's inactivated, ultraviolet uh, irradiation with a UV lamp, but um, full sunlight does a pretty good job uh, too, though I, I don't think that's been actually, um, studied directly with coronavirus, and then the heat of cooking. Any, anything you cook, uh, the virus is going to be inactivated. Okay, so at this point, um, let me um, pause and uh, open it up um, for, uh, for questions on that material. But if there's no questions, I'll go on to the vaccines and the... Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, what about high... Okay. Uh, what, what about hydrogen peroxide? Will that work? Yeah, yes, no, hydrogen peroxide is a, a potent oxidate, uh, right. Yes, hydrogen peroxide will do it too. I should have had that in the list. John, are uh, we all 
um, sort of born with viruses in us and live our whole lives with lots of viruses traveling on us, in us, and um, that are sort of the human equivalent of the bat virus that flies in the bats without causing many symptoms? Um, so um, we, we all, uh, we, back, um, that's true for bacteria. So our digestive system absolutely depends right. on, you know, there's a very high population of bacteria to help break, break things down. But we are not born uh, carrying the, these kind of viruses. These are almost all picked up, um, um, you know, during your life. Now, there are um, exceptions. Um, a herpes virus is, is latent, oral herpes, cold sores. The virus is latent in the trigeminal nerve of, that, of the face that's controlling the mouth and lips. So you always have, or you often have, the genetic material of herpes virus inside you. And then certain stresses, cold or anxiety, um, activates it somehow in your cold sores. I'm not sure um, if it's known whether, no, I don't think herpes virus is, is, is transmitted through the utero because those cells haven't differentiated yet. The, the, the uterus doesn't have nerve cells. So those are also picked up uh, later in life. Hi, Jonathan. Mm. I have a question for you. Uh, first of all, just procedurally, are you viewing the chat box where some people may be uh, uh, typing in questions? Uh, I'm just opening it. Um, and my question uh, is, I know it's more complicated than I'll be under be able to understand in in this um, seminar, but can you briefly sort of explain the difference between DNA and RNA? Well, you know, it, it's a very minor uh, chemical difference of one hydroxyl group, one, one OH group on the units, which are called nucleotides, that are strung together to make DNA and, and RNA. So those molecules are very, very similar to each other. Uh, DNA is a little more stable uh, than RNA. The, the difference from a medical point of view, and it's profound, is our human cells, our genes are DNA, right? Uh, the, the RNA is, acts as a messenger carrying information from the genes to the, to the ribosomes. But to, for our cells to reproduce, they have to copy their DNA. So if you're infected with a DNA virus, a drug that interferes with DNA replication, that's going to be, um, you know, you have to worry about that because that's likely to interfere with, you know, a replication of your own cells, your skin cells, your liver cells, or uh, 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 lung cells. Um, so the differences are very subtle, but it makes a difference in terms of um, uh, therapy. Thank you. And this is understood to be an RNA virus? This is an RNA virus. What's the relative size between your average bacterium and your average virus? Uh, magnitude or a thousand? Two, two, two orders of two orders of magnitude. You know the um, the, vi the viruses are hundreds of angstroms in diameter, and um, the bacteria are, are, are many are ten thousand. Ten thousand. Uh, if you remember back to that first uh, early slide I showed, I showed one virus particle infecting a bacterial. Uh, cell. Um, now, human cells are 50 times bigger or 100 times bigger than bacterial cells. So, uh, coronavirus uh, is dwarfed by uh, a, a, a lung, lung cell, right? The, the cells are much, much, much uh, bigger. Uh, okay. Jonathan, I, I have just one quick question. When the uh, virus replicates inside a, a human cell, uh, what is destructive about it? Is it the total volume of the virus that, uh, that comes into the cell? Okay, so first place, not all viruses kill the cells that they infect. Some of them bud out and the cells stay intact. And in those cases, the pathology is often not that serious. 
Others actively break open the cell to release the new virus particles. So that, then the cell is actually destroyed and you can get real serious pathology, right? If you think about the lining, I'm sure you don't think about the lining of your lung very often, but that's a kind of single layer of, of cells that have to stay intact uh, for the oxygen transfer. So those cells actually die physically, um, break, break open. You have a serious problem, you have a wound. The body has to heal the wound, it uses collagen to heal the wound, you get scar tissue in the lung, that region of the lung doesn't work that well for, for oxygen. So that's um, a, a critical thing in affecting the, the, the pathology. I don't know actually for coronavirus um, to what extent when it's budding out, it leaves the cell intact or what extent it, it breaks open. But we're gonna revisit this when we talk about the immune response. Okay. And are you, going to, are you going to be speaking uh, to the question of viral load at some point? Um, no, and the reason is I don't, I haven't seen any data. Uh, well, let me address that uh, right now for a second. Um, in most of these cases, one virus particle cannot initiate an infection. I mean, if you're walking along and you breathe in uh, some air that has a single uh, uh, coronavirus, you're, in. you're not going to get sick, and you're not going to get sick. You can get ten or hundred particles. Now, for some viruses, these have been measured. Uh, how many particles do you need to um, be exposed to um, to get an actual infection? Sadly, it's, it was historically the biological weapons program where a lot of this was done because they were trying to find infectious agents that were really infectious at, at low dose. And so the army uh, uh, made a lot of such measurements. In the case of coronavirus, that hasn't yet been, uh, been measured. I have a question. How does our um, immune system come into play then? Okay, so that's, I'm gonna go, uh, let me go back to the talk because that's just where okay, um, thank you. I, I was at. So now I have to go share a screen. Can we get a copy of the PowerPoint? Is it public? Uh, you're, you're welcome to it, yeah. Uh, how do I get the PowerPoint back? Is it on MIT.edu or something? Uh, no, but we'll... Um, we'll yeah, post a video of this talk and we'll link the PowerPoint from there on, on the SP Sections video page on YouTube. Uh, I'll also email it to everyone who attended or registered to the event. Thank you. All right, so here's, all right, here we're back to the slideshow. All right, so let's talk about the immune response. All of you have circulating in your blood and in your lymph nodes, um, white cells. Um, uh, one of the class of white cells are called B cells, um, and the second class are called T cells or killer cells. They're, they're all made in the bone marrow. They're close cousins of red blood, blood cells but the white blood cells are specifically to defend your body from attack. All kinds of things, from viruses, from bacteria, from fungi, from parasites, from um, uh, peanut and pollen allergens, et cetera. The B cells, which are most uh, important for the, uh, this discussion, synthesize a class of proteins called antibodies, right? And you all have these antibodies circulating in your bloodstream. The antibodies all are Y-shaped, uh, and the tips. Hi, uh, Jonathan. We're not seeing we're not seeing the slides right now. Oh, Could you check that? Share. <laughs> share uh, screen. At the bottom. Um, my, you know, when I'm in the slideshow, it doesn't show. I don't have that control. Uh, Cole, can you share my screen? Uh, I don't think so. I can. I can't access. Uh, okay, wait a minute. Okay, hold it. Let's start again. Let me put up this. Uh, okay, hold it. Hold it. There we go. Got it. Got it. Very good. No. 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 Just a minute. Just a minute.
Oh, were you sharing your screen before? Yeah, I was sharing my screen. Yeah, you were. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Now we got it. <laughs> can you see it now? Yeah, yep. we can. Yep, okay, so that, that, that blue green thing is an antibody molecule. It has, um, it has two, it has four protein chains. They're just shown as these blobs. And the tips are special. The tips are able to recognize foreign objects like a coronavirus. Now, um, it's, it's easy to get confused. Antibody are the proteins that do the work. The a antigen is the phrase used to refer to what they're recognizing or binding to. Uh, so that's a, a generic term, meaning anything that antibodies respond to or, 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 or bind to. In our case, we're interested in the, in the virus. So again, the antibodies are in purple. They bind to antigens, which are here shown in orange, or in this case, it's on the cell surface. Here's something floating around in, in the bloodstream. You have in your body many, 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 many different slight variants of B cells, and they're making antibodies. Some small number of, of the antibodies that are in your bloodstream, some very small number, um, can probably recognize uh, coronavirus. You certainly have antibodies that can recognize flu because you either had a flu vac uh, vaccination or you, you, you had the flu. And the antibodies bind to the antigen. They signal the cell that made them to start reproducing. And so over days and weeks, you get an increase in your blood of cells that are making antibodies that can zap the, vi the virus. What a vaccine is, what a vaccine is, it's usually the virus itself that's been inactivated by ultraviolet light, by heat, by chemicals. The well-known vaccines, one you got when you were a kid, the polio virus, the mumps, measles, smallpox, and others uh, are, uh, are inactivated virions. By the way, I'm old enough. I had polio when I was a kid. Wow. Uh, I had it um, in my knees uh, when I was three. I recovered, but I wore uh, special shoes and braces when I was young. I mean, there's no doubt the disease marked, uh, you know, marked my growing up, probably marked uh, um, my whole life. That was before the, uh, um, the Salk, the Salk vac vaccine. Uh, this is an interesting memory. I don't usually think about it, but it came to life. All right, now, so that's the traditional virion. So you, so you have to grow up and concentrate a whole lot of coronavirus, and then you inactivate it, and then you inject it into the person, and the white cells get all hyped up and start making antibodies. And the next time you get exposed to the infectious virus, they get zapped by the antibodies. Now, nowadays, we know how to make vaccines, not from the complete virus, but from, the, from those spike proteins of the virus, just the isolated proteins. They're safer because you don't have to worry about there being some, some leftover active virus um, in, in the presentation. They're not always as effective as the real virus because the immune system knows the difference between an icosahedral shell with hundreds of subunits and an isolated subunit, but they work. A new kind of vaccine is to um, in, get into your body the, the genetic material, the RNA of the, or the DNA of, of the virus, in case of the coronavirus. A lot of groups are working on that. Um, these vaccines work by a, a variety of methods. In some case, the nucleic acid stimulates the cell to make the viral protein, and then the immune response is like above. In other case, they interfere directly with the uh, replication of the RNA. Now, by the way, uh, so here's uh, this adenovirus spike. Here's the actual structure of this protein. Each of these colored chains is a, a protein chain. And you don't have to know anything about biochemistry. You can look at this and say, wow. That is pretty complicated. 
the way those three chains are folded up and wrapped around each other. So my research group spent 10 or 20 years figuring out how is it that the amino acid sequence of these, poly, these protein chains directed it to do that, to wrap around and spiral around and fold, fold, fold like, like that. And, and we sorted that out. At that time, that was considered uh, kind of basic research. Uh, because it turns out you can't have them fold up. They have to stay unfolded and then they have to wrap around in some precise precise register. And then, and then after they've wrapped around, then they fold, fold further. Um, uh, at any rate, 10 years later, when the biotechnology industry recognized, oh, we can make vaccines from isolated spikes, we just get the isolated spike protein. But they started by having to synthesize the protein in some kind of cell. And in the early days, they failed. They didn't get spike proteins. And my, my students were able to uh, help the biotechnology industry realize that, oh, this process can go wrong and you can get a, you can get a total mess that's not a, a well-formed spike. And it's a ni nice example of where the basic research funded by the NIH then turned out to be the platform uh, that was uh, that was very useful. Apologies for the plug, but you know, we spent 20 years doing this stuff. Uh, now let's move to drug therapies. I, I, um, I like vaccines. I like drug therapies too. Uh, many groups are working on many different fronts. One front is trying to inhibit the RNA replication of the coronavirus. There are compounds, one of them called remdesivir, which was already known to work on SARS virus and other RNA viruses. And there are a bunch of cousins of them. Here, the mechanism is well understood, prevents the replication of the viral uh, um, RNA. Another class, which has uh, been uh, an active area of uh, HIV uh, virology, is uh, small molecules that prevent the assembly inside the cell of the next of the, the, the new generation of particles. Because it's very complicated for these hundreds of subunits to come together, package the RNA, and make an infectious virus. So there's a whole class of compounds that interfere with that. Uh, there are some that, that, that act earlier on, they prevent the, they act like an antibody. They, they interfere with the attachment of the virus of, of from, from the cell. One, one of these that's in testing is called Camisad. And then some of you have heard about things like interferon and chloroquine. Uh, that's chloroquine's the one that, um, uh, that Trump referred to. They don't act on the virus directly. They, they, act, they stimulate um, the immune response. Immune response is very complicated. I, I just talked about the B cells, for example, and whole other area and very important are the, uh, the killer white cells. They recognize cells that are infected and they phagocytize and destroy the infected uh, cell. When you're coughing up phlegm, that's uh, dead cells and the white cells that have, called, that have engulfed them. All right, now I'd like to move to, um, you know, what do we need to get uh, new vaccines and uh, and new drugs. So all of the previous information comes from biomedical research carried out after World War II in laboratories across the nation, almost entirely funded by your tax dollars coming through the National Institutes of Health and National Science Foundation. Anybody who has ever read an article that said, MIT scientists discover, or Harvard scientist, or Boston College scientist, or Worcester Polytechnic, no. Those are all scientists that are paid by the National Institute of Health. Graduate students in the biosciences do not pay tuition, they are paid. And thank goodness they're paid because that keeps them work. Across the country, we're talking about about 300,000 scientific staff, graduate students, research technicians, postdoctoral fellows, junior faculty. This funding is completely outside the healthcare system. It's not through Medicaid, it's not through Medicare, it's not through, through hospitals, it's through these, these agencies. Here was the 2017 congressional budget. Uh, in that year, um, 
53% went explicitly to the military. Of course, it's, that's an underestimate because a lot of hidden funds that are military funds in here. More than half went to you know, new weapons. 3% went to the National Institutes of Health. That is, the agency respond, responsible for dealing with all the illnesses that we face, cancer, heart disease, stroke, Alzheimer's disease, arthritis, diabetes, got 3% of the federal budget, right? Uh, the military got 53%. The National Science Foundation, also important, less than 1% of, of the budget. That is insane. That's insane in terms of national policy. But it's very clear, uh, Trump was, let me take the bottom quote. This is from Trump's then uh, budget director, Mick Mulvaney. He said simply in defending to, to the Republican governors, you know, why were they cutting NIH and Meals on Wheels, et cetera? He said simply, the White House's priority was military spending and that other reductions were necessary to advance the goal. So that happened in his first budget, second budget, same thing in, in, the, in, the, in the current um, budget. Where does that really come from? That was going on before Trump. So um, let me just, uh, in the last couple of slides, I wanna focus in on the most egregious part of this, which is this proposal to spend something like 1.7 billion on upgrading all three components of the nuclear weapons triads, right? Uh, uh, sub submarines, bombers, uh, IB IBM missiles. Uh, it's going up and up and up. A few days ago, Joe Cirincione in a talk at Harvard said he looked at him like next year's budget was $70 billion just for the, for the nuclear weapons, right? It's a total boondoggle decreases our national security because other countries think we try and, you know, we're preparing for first strike. It is totally insane. These weapons don't get us to work. They don't feed us them. They don't, uh, uh, they can't be used for research. They don't advance dealing with cor coronavirus. Uh, just to make it very concrete, here's an Ohio class sub. The U.S. has 14 of them, each armed with 24 tried missiles. Each has 12 independently targetable nuclear warheads. One of these subunits, just one of these submarines, just one, just one, launching their weapons can obliterate the major cities of any country on Earth: Russia, China. India, et cetera. Uh, the the uh, government wants to buy eight to 10 more of these uh, submarines. Uh, and of course, um, if they obliterate every city in, in Russia, uh, believe me, that's the end of life for most of us because the, the, uh, the nuclear winter uh, would cause worldwide famine. Few of us would, would survive. Does that money, that money does not go to a serviceman. The biggest chunk of it goes to a small number of large corporations, Boeing, uh, General Dynamics, Hunting Ming, Lockheed Martin is, is, is the biggest. Basically, the nuclear weapons program, it's the business plan of the military industrial complex, it has nothing to do with national security. They get these billions of dollars. They then recycle these funds to influence and control congressional budget decisions. It represents the corruption of our congressional policy making at the deepest level. In the last uh, defense, uh, the, the, uh, both the Senate and House committees putting together the defense budget, not a single component was cut. Not a single component. Everything that the industry wanted they, they got. Um, I won't go into else. Well, okay. So let me say that we haven't gotten very far in the last 20 years in tackling this form of corruption, but the coronavirus, because it's so such a stress on the whole nation, right, I think is opening up uh, a new opportunity. Many, many, many people think that many organizations, and we think that funding healthcare and not warfare is not going to be a slogan. We're going to be able to make that into an actual campaign and actually cut uh, some of this funding. Our own Senator Markey is in the lead. His sane bill cuts the, the most egregious of the nuclear weapons, 75 billion. Uh, and we hope he'll refile the sane bill this year and we'll build a movement to get some of those cuts in.
All right, at that, um, I'm done and I'm open for, let's open up the general discussion. Did we take some of the questions in the chat? Do you want to start with those? So one, um, I don't know if Charlie Welch is on the call. If if Charlie wants to ask his question, um, or would you like me to ask it? Uh, let's see. Is there an order? How should I take? I'm looking at the oh, chat. Yeah. So um, let's see. There, Charlie Welch asked this question: Can you comment on the usefulness of the Cuban-produced interferon variant? Uh, so, so interferon has been uh, around for a, a long time. Uh, it was originally touted as a, you know, a real silver bullet against viral infections. Um, it, it helps with some infections, with some hep hepatitis. Uh, I think there's, there's some evidence that it alleviates the symptoms of, um, uh, may alleviate the symptoms from coronavirus, a small study in, in, in China. Uh, the Cubans, uh, I have gotten very skilled at producing uh, interferon and making it available, but it's it's unlikely. It doesn't really block the the infection. It's it's a boost to your immune system to to responding to the cells. My, might might turn out to be much better than people think, but the evidence so far is uh, it's, it's not what we need really to to knock down the frequency of infection very high. Okay, one other question from Louise Coleman. Uh, the meat markets in China where this virus originated from are cultural. What can change the situation? Another virus is inevitable. Uh, well, the, those kind of environments, right, where, you know, wild animals are, are being uh, marketed as, 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 as food, you know, that's a global problem, the destruction of, of habitat. That's why many epidemiologists think that these kind of outbreaks are only going to increase in frequency because you know the kind of poverty we can't quickly eliminate you know, poverty in East Africa or, or Haiti or that, that part of China. So that, that's going to be many many decades before those kind of um, environments get get controlled. And that's why we need to rent, we we shouldn't be spending billions on nuclear weapons. We should be spending billions on vaccine development and training virologists and being able to roll out tests uh, very quickly. By the way, the really sensitive tests for viruses are not to test for the nucleic acid, which is what the current test is. It's to test for antibodies. That's a little blood test. You take a drop of blood from the, somebody's fingertip. In 15 or 20 minutes, you get a very reliable readout. That could have been developed after uh, the SARS virus, but the U.S., uh, you know, we nickeled and dimed the Center for Disease Control, the NIH Infectious Disease Unit, uh, and we, we can't do that, right? We have to really beef up those sectors of the economy. Now, one thing, the government, you know, this, the Congress voted uh, for the CARES Act on Friday the 27th, two, $2 billion, but uh, the most of that was economic bailout, right? Only a very, very, very small fraction of it uh, was for beefing up the NIH, the Center for Disease Control, uh, et cetera, uh, unfortunately. It's so small that you can't find it uh, if you go to uh, websites, congressional websites that describe the CARES Act. They don't even mention uh, that sector. Um, here's a question from uh, James Wilberforce. Can you comment on the biotech industry and business, which is very big here in Cambridge, as we right. know? Okay, so there's two aspects of that. In the, in the United States, vaccine and drug development is completely privatized. It is not possible in the United States for publicly funded scientists to develop a vaccine or a drug. This is very, very sad. Uh, this is not true in other countries, and historically it wasn't true. In, uh, in Jamaica Plain and Forest Hills, we have a state lab that was originally developed in the 1930s uh, to produce vaccines because companies weren't willing to, to take, take the risk. So on the one hand, now, we have this very developed and sophisticated biotech industry, ph pharmaceutical industry, employs 200,000 people, but because it's private, everybody in the end is looking at their bottom line. And there's this privatization involved secrecy. So if you're working for a biotech company 
uh, A, and you have a good idea about a vaccine, a subunit vaccine, you don't share your results with company B, right? Which may have to do the same thing over again. And one thing you don't share is the failures. Uh, so the process though we have this very highly trained scientific workforce, the privatization of it really in interferes. Um, mm. And uh, it's, it's very unfortunate. It'd be nice if we could kind of nationalize the vaccine development right. uh, process. And I don't, I, don't see, I don't see why not. Jonathan, there were a few comments um, and questions asked when people signed up um, for the for this talk, and uh, one was on. I'm trying to. I don't co totally understand it, but something about uh, the U.S. program that developed biological warfare and around uh, the coronavirus being one of 20 agents that was developed under that United, that U.S. program in this 1969. Uh, I don't, that's from David, a question from David. And uh, just if, I guess, the connection between this and any sort of previous biological warfare program that the U.S. might have been involved in. I don't know uh, if you've heard anything about that. Yeah, so, um, you know, the, the U.S. Um, and the Soviet Union and France and England and other nations um, after World War, II, World War II, they had biological weapons programs. The U.S. one was sort of centered at Fort Detrick, uh, outside of Bethesda, and then there was a lab on the tip of Long Island and a couple other places. Um, and uh, scient we, the scientists organized, the biological scientists organized a major campaign to that we should sign the Biological Weapons Convention, which was then cir circulating. Um, uh, and we did, we did. The US signed the Biological Weapons Convention uh, and said, no, we're not gonna, you can't, you can't work on, you can't develop, you can't stockpile, you can't test, you can't do anything in that direction. Um, however, they had this um, little escape valve called biological defense, saying, well, you can work on biological defense. But what happened after 9-11 is the Homeland Security uh, program began funding, quote, biological defense programs all over the country. Well, biological defense and biological op offense are exactly the same. If you can have a biological weapon, you have to be able to defend your own people. You have to have a, va a vaccine, right? That's, you, you, need, you need infectious virus and a vaccine, both for offense and, and defense. So there has been a proliferation in the United States of, of, of these labs, um, which, um, you know, if, when you see, oh, when, when someone like me sees an Ebola outbreak in the U.S. or a Dengue Valley fever outbreak in, in the U.S., you know, I, I worry about that. Uh, the evidence that the Chinese, that the, uh, the, that the coronavirus, that COVID-19, or the SARS virus or MERS virus comes from accidents at, at secret biological weapons facilities. You know, I, it, it, it's always possible. Um, but on the other hand, you know, many of these uh, organisms developed before there was modern uh, warfare. The 1917, I guarantee you, the, the Spanish flu right, did not come from a biological weapons lab. There wasn't any, any such thing. So we know that these viruses arise in nature all, all, all the time. I think we have to be constantly uh, on the lookout uh, and, and, and we need to continually actively suppress uh, the John Boltons of the world you know, who want to launch these kind of campaigns. But right now, you know, the problems we're faced with are out there. Uh, okay, question, Jonathan, from Martha. <clears throat> um, do ACE inhibitors play any role in spike protein attachment? Right, right. so that's a very interesting question. Um, so ACE, um, uh, so the, the drugs um, that, that most of us take um, work against the form of the ACE enzyme that is circulating in your bloodstream. It doesn't work against this one, the ACE2 receptor which is bound to cells. Um, however, um, some people, some physicians 
um, still think that it's that it's possible since you know all these proteins are kind of linked together in this as a network that there may be uh, some effect. So there's there's active interest in ACE inhibitors. You know, do they have any effect on uh, coronavirus? And also, there's another class of blood pressure blocking agents that that are block the binding of, of the enzyme. It's an active area of research. Uh, if there's any effect, it's not going to be missed. Mm. Uh, okay, how about a question from, there was an earlier question. You know, someone actually had asked a question that's a very basic one on the, when people signed up is, is whether this is, can it live in the air outside? around this the question was can the virus live in the air outside around town so uh, the virus is inactivated on 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 drying almost all viruses are interacting with drying. not spores not anthrax spores they, they survive drying those are bacterial spores so viruses particles are especially membrane ones are inactivated on drying if you're in a little the smaller the droplet the more quickly the fluid evaporates, uh, the more you're susceptible to sunshine and things like that. So uh, it's, um, but the question is, well, exactly how long, you know, if someone is six feet away from me and they sneeze, uh, how long does the virus survive in those droplets? And the big droplets are going to fall to the ground. The little ones will stay in the air, but the fluid will. Uh, evaporate. Um, it's um, you know the the kind of data one wants here doesn't exist. Mm. I'm sure groups are measuring that as we speak. It does last longer on surfaces like cardboard and metal than than uh, flu virus uh, does. So washing is still a good thing to do. Um. Could Trump use the Defense Production Act? This is a question from Frank Lee. Could Trump use the Defense Production Act to effectively nationalize the vaccine development effort? Uh, yes, he could, and I personally I think he should. Right? Um, you know, it is crazy to have these companies not sharing uh, data in the academic community. Scientists all over the world are sharing uh, their their data with each other, and they're not worrying about who gets credit for discovery. But that's in the realm outside the biotech industry. My understanding is inside the biotech industry, same thing. They're, they're trying to file for patents. You can't get a patent if the information was released publicly. So you, you don't, um, you know, it, it is a, I cannot tell you what a depressing experience it, it is. You go to a meeting and there are speakers from the biotech and pharmaceutical industry and they don't report experiments you know they did because they were done, they were done by your students who are working for them because they haven't yet filed for their patent uh, application and they're worried about an interference suit. So there's no doubt that the privatization um, interferes. On the other hand, it's a very big, it's a big enough sector of the economy that it could move real quick. So I think nationalization is the way to go and Defense Production Act. Uh, but I would, with the current administration, it's hard to imagine that taking place. Now wait a minute. We're at 8 p.m. Yep. We don't. We our general thing is we don't want to bait and switch. Tell people we'll be done by eight. I think we should um, finish by eight. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, you know, still around. Uh, people can email me um, questions. Um, uh, but again, I, I'm not an epidemiologist or a physician. I'm just somebody who's studying viruses and viral proteins. So in two weeks, um, uh, well, uh, we're going to have an, a second one, uh, not on this, but on uh, Andrea. What's our um, oh people on the front lines? We're going to have a number of people who are on the front lines, and you know, April nineteenth is that right? Yeah, the, April nineteenth. Yes, same time, same time. So come back in two weeks, um, and we'll hear from those people who are right right up there on the front lines of handling the outbreak. Thank, Thank you, you all so much. Everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Everyone have a great evening. Take care. Stay well. Carry on. <laughs>